so much the lawyer has. May I ask a special request from the host so that I can put on my video, please?
Lawyer Hayes, thank you so much. The music was so beautiful, but it would have been more lovely if we saw your faces. Can I share my screen? I mean, my, my video? Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I'm so excited to see all the church members online today. And my young people are still clicking in and joining. And I want to be thankful to the Lord who has been with us for the last uh, two weeks. Actually, today is the 14th presentation. We have had a good time trying to examine if we are connected or distracted. We see that uh, in the world which we're living in now, people are depending on virtual connections. And if you are not careful, there are so many things that are going to distract you and you end up not getting the right connection that you actually want. Or you miss out on the most important things and the aspects of the meeting that are taking place. We saw through the whole week that even God has always done things through the virtual uh, media. Our connection with him is virtual. We saw that the judgment will be virtual and everything these days is virtual. So you all need to be very careful to stay connected and avoid distractions because we saw that the enemy or the arch enemy of connections is doctor distraction, whom we have to avoid all the time. We had a lot of tips through the week and we have done a lot of studies through these two weeks. And we are almost coming to an end. And today is the second last presentation where we'll be examining the longest honeymoon. And I want to ask you that you stay on and please come back tomorrow so that we can finish together in a big way. But before we enter into the subject for tonight, there were some questions that were asked by people who have been following night, night after night. And um, uh this thing seem okay so somebody asked this question that how do you insist on sabbath while when we are on sabbath on saturday other part of the world will be on friday or sunday is really the day of worship an issue you know um this question was hard actually even when i received it I was with my friend, we sit together in the same office. We don't share the faith, but we discussed it. And we said, is it really something that should really bother us whether in America it's, it, it, it's in the day and in Rwanda it's in the night, another part of the world is coming to the morning. Is it something we should be worried about? Because at least at the end of the day, Every country has what calls a Saturday, has what calls a Sunday, and what calls a Wednesday. And when we cross over to the other side, we don't find any problem. Actually, I always see that uh, the way God did it is to make sure that things are done in order at particular times and with different uh, regions. We see when Christmas draws on and people are doing what they do in the celebrations. You find it starts from one place, goes to another, goes to another, like that. And they will say, even the second coming of Jesus might be just like that. These people see him, others see him in that sequence. And we see him almost at the same time because it is seven o'clock to be seven o'clock or whoever will be wherever they are. So to me, my brother or my sister, I don't know who you are, but I want to admit to you that um, the issue of the day you may say it's not very important, but when you examine it critically, it becomes important because the Lord really wants his day. The reason is we started together that this day God blessed, this day God rested on it, and he sanctified it and set it apart as a special day. And I want to admit to you, it's not us. Actually, when I speak, it's not me. And I don't want anybody to say that a living story said this and this, because night after night, I've been teaching you through the word of God. And even tonight, I want to share you some verses and you'll conclude for yourself if it is I saying it or if it is the Bible saying it. In Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel said this about this day. Ezekiel chapter 20, and we're just reading verse 4 where the Bible says, Moreover, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I'm the Lord that sanctified them. 
this is God, not me. So when you say you insist, my brother, my sister, the insisting is just based on the word of God. Listen to chapter 22, verse 26, what the Bible says about those who don't actually show people the difference between these days. Listen carefully. Verse 26 says, her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they shown the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hid their eyes from my Sabbath and am profaned among them. My brother, my sister, those priests, those people who stand for God, who don't teach his people to differentiate between the right and wrong, the clean and unclean, the difference between a, a normal day and the Sabbath, just to make God become profaned in their midst. I want to challenge you that don't just take some of these things very lightly. Go deep, deep, deep. Read between the lines. Why is God so interested in this particular day and not any other day? Isaiah, the honored prophet who prophesied a lot about Jesus Christ, his birth, his crucifixion, about the new earth. He had a lot to say about the Sabbath. My brother, my sister, I want to challenge you that you better take these things seriously. Isaiah said, in Isaiah 56 verse one, he says, thus says the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice. For my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this and the son of man that layeth hold on it. And he says that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. And he continues, neither let the son of the stranger that had joined himself to the Lord speak saying, the Lord hath utterly separated me from his people, neither let the Enoch say, because I am a dry tree. Verse 4, for thus says the Lord, and to the Enoch that keep my Sabbath, and choose the thing that please me, and take hold of my covenant, even unto them I'll give in mine house, and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I'll give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Verse six, also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servant, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and take hold of my covenant, even them and bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer and their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted before my altar for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. So my brother, my sister, it's not us, it's God. It says whether you are a stranger, whether you are an eunuch, whoever you are, if you keep the Sabbath of the Lord, the Lord is going to welcome you into his kingdom. This is his promise. 58, verse 13, he says, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing the pressure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thy own ways, nor finding thy own pressure, nor speaking thy own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will call thee to light upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Though I'm using my mouth here, you are hearing me, but I'm reading something that God himself says, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about an religious leader. It's not about who, but what does the Bible say? Yesterday, we discussed uh, and we saw 
from the, the also uh, we're trying to answer the question the difference between the sunday worship and saturday worship we discover that on sunday this is a day that's not sanctified this is a day that was not made blessed this is a day that god never rested on it though we decide to rest on it and call it a sabbath but the bible says the sabbath the particular day out of seven so my brother my sister you may think that uh, being in America or in China or in Rwanda exonerates you from keeping the Sabbath. It doesn't. God intended it. The sun sets when he wants. And when the sun sets on Friday, the Sabbath has started. And when the sun sets on Saturday, the Sabbath has ended. So it doesn't matter which part of the world you are in, but Sabbath really matters a lot. So thank you, but keep asking. Though tomorrow we have the last questions. If you have your questions still burning, please bring it over. So tonight, I'm so happy to see many of you online, especially my elders from KC. I'm so happy to see my pastor, Tommy. Thank you so much for reminding us of what Jesus did for us. And I praise God for your ministry. God bless you so much. And as we enter into the subject of tonight, allow me to pray once more time. Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for the blessing of the Sabbath. My the King of Kings, I want to thank you that tonight we are going to discuss your word in big numbers, Lord, because many of your people have been let loose from the, the, the daily uh, work that they do. And now in the blessed hours, they can sit comfortably and listen to your word. I want to pray, dear Father, that you come and visit with us and speak to us on this important subject so that we become serious and know why we are here, what we should are doing here, where we are going, and what we should expect in the next few days. Come and speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. So my brother, my sister, we are studying about the longest honeymoon. I was trying to discover what these honeymoons were about. I was very shocked that while most couples today travel on their own, to their honeymoon alone, where they have no disturbances, that's not the way it used to be. Couples in the 19th century Britain, they use their honeymoon to go on a bridal tour. They go and visit their families. They go and visit their friends, people who are not able to attend their ceremonies. Honeymoon is the best time for every young person. I know every young person here who is looking for that day, looks forward to the happiest time of their life. Honeymoon is the sweetest time of somebody's life. Let me tell my brothers, those who have been there know it, but this was just a foretaste of the true honeymoon that me and you should be waiting for. Couples choose very good, refreshing, a very good site where they can have good time. But my brother and my sister, sometimes honeymoon turn out to be something different. How long should the honeymoon last? You know, I was reading that in traditional ways, some people would connect the honeymoon with the honey and the moon, trying to see the full moon and how it fades away. So that honeymoon was like a warning that it doesn't last forever. The love that you express during the honeymoon starts going down as you start the normal chores of life. Some people end up their honeymoon in a tragic way. This couple had gone to Greece in the most popular place for honeymoons, but this man died in the fire. Some people go to their honeymoon only to end up fighting during that time. I witnessed one couple on their second day of honeymoon. The man looked at this woman, he gave her a big slap and said, whoa, what a honeymoon. Yesterday, I was told of this man who went to honeymoon in Gisenyi, and after day number two, he said, no, 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 I can't keep here. The beer in Kigali is sweeter. So my friend, let's go to Kigali. The wife said, no, 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 we can't go to Kigali. We have come to this place to enjoy ourselves. So how can we go back to Kigali? What will people talk about us? What if they see you just two days after? What will they think? The man said, look, you either come and we go or you stay. The woman thought that this man was joking. And he packed in things. And people saw the guy already in, in, in the streets of Kigali the following day. And that was the end of their marriage. But let me tell you, 
The honeymoon I'm talking about tonight is a honeymoon that's going to have no end. It's the longest honeymoon that you can ever imagine. The longest that you can imagine. The honeymoon that Jesus is going to take his pride on, his people, his church, the one that he has paid the price for at Calvary on the tree. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8, the Bible says, my brother, when I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you are the age of love. And I spread my corn of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. My brother and my sister, I want to tell you, Jesus paid the price. And when you accept him as your Lord and Savior, he says, you are mine for Forever. In Hosea chapter 2, verse 14, he says, Therefore, behold, I will roar her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. In the Good News Bible, he puts it this way So I'm going to take her into the desert again and I win her back with words of love. My brother, my sister, there are some of us in church who used to be so close to Jesus Christ. But as you has gone by, distractions kept coming. Distractions kept coming away. And our love for Christ has gone away. And Jesus is saying, I want to take you back to the desert. I want to take you back. And I want to speak to you with words of love and win you back to me. Jesus is looking for people tonight. Jesus. He's preparing a people that he wants to go, that he wants to take to the longest honeymoon that you can ever imagine in your life. In verse 19, he says, and I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yeah, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and loving kindness and in mercies. Still, good news puts it this way. I'll make you my wife. I'll be true and faithful. I will show you constant love and mercy and make you mine forever. This is Jesus' wish for the church tonight. This is Jesus' wish for you tonight. He wants to make you his forever. And in verse 20, he says, And I betroth thee and unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. This word, no. It's just not a simple word. Why pass by the side of so and so? No, 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 no. This is what they gonna tell us that there is a relationship. There is a connection. And my brother and my sister, I want to promise you tonight that is a wedding day coming soon. Be prepared for the honeymoon. Be prepared for Jesus Christ because he's soon coming to take his people to the longest honeymoon that has ever imagined, my brother. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 4, 5, he says, For your maker is your husband, and the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth. He is called. Jesus is coming to take his people. Revelation 19 verse 7 says, Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. Are you preparing yourself? You know, I've had or witnessed so many weddings so far and I see how they prepare the bride. You know, once the wedding day comes, sometimes you feel they have not prepared enough. They want to work on the earrings. They want to work on her face. They want to work on her lips. They want to work on her clothes. Everything has to be ready in preparation to be the bridegroom. My brother and my sister, how are we preparing? Are we ready? Is the bride ready? How are we preparing? My brother and my sister, I thank God because night after night, he has reached to us with his word to prepare us for his coming. Jesus says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. So soon and very soon, Jesus is taking us to the longest honeymoon that you ever imagined. And this is a honeymoon of 1,000 years. Honeymoon of 1,000 years. The book of Revelation 
talks about 1,000 years. The focus normally is on the bounding of the devil, but I want us to focus more on what the people of God shall be doing in heaven during their honeymoon, away from the problems of this world, away from the sinfulness of this world, away from the death of this world, away from the pain of this world, away from the noise of this world, away from everything that pains us in this world, to our home in glory, in the new Jerusalem. There we shall spend a thousand years with our Lord Jesus Christ without any interruption, without any prayer calling you, without any businessman calling you. My brother, my sister, I long for that honeymoon. What about you? Revelation 20 verse 1 says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and the Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on it so that he should not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after the things he must be raised for a little while. So the devil is going to be chained for 1,000 years, what we call the millennium. Millennium, 1,000 years. What will start this millennium? The Bible tells us that the millennium is bound by two resurrections. There's a resurrection of life at the beginning and the resurrection of damnation at the end of it. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 25, and said, Most assuredly, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and true those who hear will live. And he says, Marvel not at this, for the time is coming in which those that are in the graves shall hear his voice. They shall come forth. They that have done good into the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil into the resurrection of damnation. So the Bible has two resurrections, the first resurrection and the second resurrection. My brother and my sister, I want to challenge you tonight that we become so careful and we study our Bibles lest we get deceived. There was this pastor who was feeding his flock with the word of God, who was not prepared. You know, sometimes we come from work, from business, and we open and say, oh, the Lord has something for his people. And when he read this verse about the first resurrection, he said, my people, I want to challenge you. If you miss out in the first resurrection, please don't miss out on the second resurrection. He thought that the two resurrections, both of them are good, no. My brother, I want to challenge with you. My sister, I want to challenge you that you submit to the Lord so that you'll be counted worthy to be in the first resurrection. Because the Bible says, blessed and holy is who, who has a part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So when we go to our honeymoon, we are just going to be priests with our God and with our Christ and reign with him a thousand years. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back to take his church, to take his people in glory so that we can have the longest honeymoon ever. The Bible says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise fast. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and that we shall always be with the Lord. Jesus is coming back. What a glorious description of the resurrection, my brother. You will notice that the dead in Christ will be raised first and then the followers of Christ who are alive will be called up to meet the Lord in the air. That's what the Bible promises. John chapter 11, verse 25 says, He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. 
the righteous who are dead with his elected, my brother. And they got together with Jesus in glory. And this is why I had prophesied in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 19. It says, Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, and the earth shall cast out their dead. I can't wait for that day to see mothers being reunited with their babies who had died. I can't wait for that day when husbands and wives are united. I can't wait that day when sons and daughters are united with their mom or with their dad, whoever could have passed away before. It will be a wonderful day. It will be a wonderful scene. My brother and my sister, I don't know what word I can use to describe it, but Jesus promised and he is going to do it. Tonight, I want to submit to you that Jesus can never lie. He said, I go to prepare press for you. And if I go and prepare press for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. Hallelujah. This is the promise of the Lord. Blessed and holy is he who has a part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they shall reign with, with Christ as priests of God and Christ and reign with him for a thousand years. So it's very clear there will be two resurrections. Two resurrections. One of the righteous dead, which will mark the beginning of the thousand years. As they, they resurrect, and go to live with the Lord forever, what I have termed as the longest honeymoon. You will not find this in the Bible, I'm sorry. Just like the millennium, just like the rapture, all these are words that are made up, but people can come up with words, but the end result is the same. We can see that Jesus Christ is coming. So the thousand years will begin with the resurrection of the righteous and will end with the resurrection of the doomed. So these resurrections are the ones that are in between. One marks the beginning, another marks at the end. So this is why the Bible said, and I saw the thrones and they sat on the them and judgment was committed to them. Ah, this is interesting. Those who resurrect are going to participate in judgment, you know, my brother and my sister, I want to tell you that there will be three resurrections. I mean, three judgments. The first judgment will be done. It's carrying, it's going on even as we talk. Since 1844, the judgment started. And as soon as that judgment is ended, Jesus will remove his priestly robe and put on his royal Rob and come to take his people, those who will have been counted worthy to receive the kingdom of God. The second judgment will take place in heaven when the those who have been selected and those who have been translated will join the holy angels in the judgment to judge the wicked, the angels that fell and Lucifer himself. The third judgment will be done after when everybody now will have resurrected so that the final judgment will be passed. This is why in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, Paul had written to the saints and told them, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? That's the time they're going to judge them. Do you not know that we shall judge the angels? That's what he was talking about. Now, we're going to see that everyone will have the opportunity to see that God is just and loving and fair. For all these a thousand years, Satan has labeled as a culturization of God, that God is unfair and loving and unjust. But why would we need to judge the evil angels and the wicked sinners? Because they are lost their way. Have they been judged by four Christ comes? However, much as it is true, many of us will be convinced, will not be convinced by what we see in heaven. You know, there are going to be so many surprises in heaven. You are going to miss somebody thought must make it. You don't find them there. 
You are going to find there people you thought would never make it. But in yourself, you may be surprised yourself to find yourself there. But praise be to God, because he paid the price for us all. Amen? He paid it all so that we can make it to the kingdom. But I want you to imagine for one moment, have you ever wondered what your election might be if you look for someone in heaven whom you expect to find there, only to find that that person is lost forever? Don't you think you might doubt or question the fairness of God's justice? My brother and my sister, this will be time for you to examine the books and the angels in glory will be showing you what the fate of everybody was. During the millennium. the liquors of the laws will be opened and the most guarded secrets and purposes that harbor each person's mind will be exposed on that day. God's love and justice will be affirmed. Tonight I want to submit to you that the, the, the saved will sit in judgment and judge the world. The foreign angels, Lucifer, Satan, and also those that did not accept Jesus Christ. Revelation 16, verse 7 says, Even so, Lord, God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Everybody will exclaim and say, God is just in all his ways. My brother and my sister, the Bible is going to tell us what the condition of the seven is going to be. The Bible says, and the rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. Those that Jesus will find alive, they won't survive. They will die because of the word that comes from his mouth. They will not stand to see him. But those who have waited for him, those who have longed for that day, they'll be taken home in glory and they're going to have big time with Jesus Christ as others are running away to the mountains for us and my brother and my sister. The Bible tells me these are not going to be simple people. It's going to be the kings, the generals, the rich guy, all the people who have treasured what this world can offer are going to run away from the master when he comes. So my challenge tonight, I want to <laughs> beg you, don't put your trust in money, don't put your trust in possession, don't put your trust in your riches, don't put your trust in your education, put your trust in the Jesus Christ. He alone can save you. He alone was perfect and his blood can cleanse you tonight and you prepare for the longest honeymoon, my brother and my sister. Jesus is coming back. But there are so many that are going to die when they see him coming in the clouds of heaven. And Jeremiah chapter 25, chapter 3 says, and at that the day, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth, even to another end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. You know, that day, When you think of it, Malachi puts it away. It's a day that is horrible for people who have not received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Though it will be the best day for those that will be saved. But you can imagine people dying when there's nobody to bury them or to lament them. The saints have gone to heaven. Others are dying here with nobody even to care about them just become like refuse on the ground. The saved are in heaven. They have gone. Those who have died will resurrect going. Those who will be alive will be translated, changed to receive and to live and to be able to walk with the, the heavenly hosts. So this world will be left with nobody and nothing. So Revelation 20 verse 5, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years are finished. So this is the event. This is how things are going to follow each other. One, Jesus will return with the holy angels. And when he returns, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then the living saved are caught up 
to meet Jesus in the air. My brother and my sister, the Bible tells me that the self to go home with Jesus and lay with him for a thousand years. But the unsaved are slain by the brightness of the coming of Jesus Christ. And the wicked dead are not raised until after their thousand years. I hope you are having a pen and paper, you are writing the scriptures, you can go and check them for yourself and make a decision for eternity. And Jesus is going to bound the devil for a thousand years. This chain is a chain of circumstances. He will be bound by a chain of circumstances because he has no one to tempt or to destroy. You know, uh, there are things that happen on this world that can be good reason for us. You know, we have some of our friends and families, people who get uh, <laughs> arrested at home. They say you are in, he's in the house arrest. You know how bad it can be even to have a house arrest at your own home. When we were doing, having the lockdown, it was too much, yet we were with our families enjoying everything. Now you can imagine the devil who will be here alone with his evil angels for a thousand years and there's nothing to do because there's nobody to deceive anymore. Now, the righteous are in heaven and though the wicked are dead, everyone is gone, everywhere there is ruin. Nothing is happening. The devil is just here with nothing because the saved are all with Christ for a thousand years and the devil has only his evil angels to tempt and mislead. My brother and my sister, this is the worst prison that the devil is going to endure. This earth becomes his prison. He wanted to show how he would rule the world. So he took the dominion from Adam and Eve by deceit. But now everyone will be able to see what kind of a ruler he really is. That's why verse 3 said, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive nations no more till the thousand years should be finished. Nobody to deceive. But after that, he'll be lost for a little season. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23 gives us a description of what was happening during that time. And he said, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens and they had no light. It is a bottomless pit or a bosom. Jeremiah continues to say, I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled. All the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and there were birds of the heavens were afraid. I beheld, and lo, that full place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and his fierce anger. Everything that man put on this planet would be destroyed completely. Nothing will be left. What will be happening during this millennium time? The earth will be desolate and devastated. All the unsaved are dead, slain by the brightness of Jesus' coming. All the saved are in heaven, reigning with Christ their God. Satan is bound on this planet all alone without anybody. The question tonight, can this make Satan change? How about the angels? He read into rebellion. Will they have a change of heart? My brother, my sister, I want to admit to you that the meridian will demonstrate to the universe that beneath the devil and his angels had been given so many years, they would never change. They would choose the same. They would react. They would reject the plan of salvation, even though they are given a thousand chances. My brother and my sister, I want to admit to you that God is just and what he did to Lucifer was the best thing that could have ever happened to him. You know, today I was talking to one colleague at work. You know, we lost one young man in his early, actually he had no, he's, he's in his late twenties. And he was asking me, why is not God doing something? Why can't God just observe people dying day after day, night after night, and he does nothing? I told her, my sister, God has done something. 
He has made a provision through Jesus Christ who came and died, but the grave could not hold him. He rose again. And because of his resurrection, we have a hope of his resurrection because he said, I have the keys. I have the keys. Jesus became victorious. So that everybody that can submit their lives to him, Jesus has a plan. We are going to live with him. Our wish that we submit to him tonight. Now when their thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. And we go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth to gather them together for battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. So during the thousand years, people are resting on their grounds. Those are scattered everywhere. But after the thousand years, there is another resurrection because the Bible has said, but the rest of the dead lived not again until their thousand years were finished. These people, what is elect, and there will be too many, as many as the sand of the sea. The number of whom are as the sand of the sea. My brother and my sister, I don't want to continue from here, but I want to challenge each one of us. How are we prepared to meet our bride? Are we ready for the longest honeymoon? Jesus is calling tonight. Jesus is pleading with us tonight. Be ye ready. We don't know the day. Actually, it's not like our normal weddings where you set a date, you know, and uh, our elders sit and agree on a date like this, we are going to have the wedding. No, the wedding day has been a secret for God. And we saw last night, that the best way we can prepare for this wedding day is by being ready every time. Are you ready? Will you be counted well to go for that honeymoon? I want to plead with you that tonight each one examine ourselves. Has Jesus covered us with his robe, the robe of righteousness, or we still trust in our abilities? Have we surrendered to him that we have been changed? Have we been touched by his bride? Early on, our pastor was reading us into the devotion, telling us about the Holy Communion, the bread that was shed for us, his body that was broken because of our iniquities. God found it fit to put the iniquity of all of us on him. That's why. He cried on the cross, says, Abba, Abba, my father, why have you forsaken me? God had not done it because Jesus felt that the sins of the world had separated him from his father. All we need to do tonight is to surrender to Jesus Christ. Because he says, I stand at the door and knock, and if anybody opens, I will enter and sup with him. May God help us tonight. To surrender our lives to him, let us pray. Our Father, I want to pray that tonight you speak to each one of us individually. You are soon coming, Lord. The signs that we see in the world of politics, the sign that we see in the world of religion, the sign that we see in the world of society, the sign that we see in our environment are leaving no doubt that your coming is near just at the door. Can we realize the times that we are living in long? Can we be able to realize that this is not the praying time? But it's a time to seek Lord. It's a time of judgment when the church should stop being a Rukum church. It's a time 
that you need Jesus Christ to enter into our hearts and prepare us for that day when you come in your glory. May I pray, dear Lord, that all your children that are listening tonight, may you transform us in the blood of Jesus Christ. May you change us in your likeness. May you cover us with your love and graciousness. So that if you come, whether tonight or tomorrow or in a day, you find us ready to receive you and you take us home in glory. We can't wait, dear Father. Come, sweet Lord. Because the Bible says, the bride and the groom say, come. And let anyone who hears say, come. Let the church members say, come. We've been here for so long and we long to see you, our master and king. Father, tonight, as we end this meeting, I want to pray that you may bless each one of us, Lord, and visit each one of us individually so that we may be able to understand this message and the frequency that you want us to take it in. Glory and honor belong to you, and I praise you tonight, and thank you for what you have been doing for us in the past two weeks, and as we look forward to concluding tonight, Lord, and tomorrow, I want to pray that you visit and make us, Lord, make decisions for eternity. We thank and praise you. We have prayed all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah, God bless you all.